Welcome to our series, Church in History, Session 2. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine wisdom, knowledge, and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In our last series, we touched upon kind of a synopsis of the early church. We'll continue now, but we're going to be going back now and take out individual pieces of that overview and begin to look at it and say, well, what does it tell us about the situation, the church in history? What is going on in history? So we'll go back to the time of Stephen. Stephen, one of the deacons. If you recall the Hellenists, they, the Hellenists consist of those who were Jews, but also have a Greek culture. They lived outside Jerusalem. They came in for feast days. Some came into Jerusalem and they, they continued to stay there. They didn't go back to their countries. They wanted to stay in Jerusalem. Many of them actually did, but they couldn't afford to, or perhaps they couldn't find a place for them to live. So they went back home, but many stayed. And then there was kind of a prejudice that began to arise between those who are strict Jews, really people who grew up in Jerusalem, lived in Jerusalem, spoke Hebrew, and those who were now Hellenists, a mixture of cultures. Those who were Jews, but they had been living with the Greek culture for so long that many even forgot how to speak Hebrew. And so they come together now and they all believe in Christ. So what originally the Jewish people had no idea that they were starting a new religion, a new kind of way of worshiping God. They simply took Jesus' message and began to apply it to their Jewish way of thinking. But they really had different ways of thinking. The strict Jews applied it in a very strict way. The Hellenists, a little bit more lenient. So now what happens is they now realize that as they're coming together as a community, they're not all being treated equally. Those who were Hellenists, a mixture of Judaism and a culture, Greek or whatever else, they realized they weren't being treated as well as those who were strictly Jews all the way. And they complained to the disciples about this. What that shows is that even in the early church, there were matters to be settled. Even in the early church, there were conflicts conflicts between those who are strict Jews and between those who, as I said, were Hellenists. So now they're living together, but then the Hellenists begin to complain. They begin to say, we're not being treated the same way. The apostles, the followers of Jesus, closest ones to Jesus, have to admit that this is what's happening, that there is this division. So what do they do? They say, well, what we'll do is we'll elect seven deacons, seven being a kind of mystical number. And the deacons now would be taken from among the Hellenists, Jewish Hellenists, those who converted to Christ, who were Jews by, found, by origin, but also who had a lot of Greek culture in them. So they chose these seven deacons. And it says in the Acts of the Apostles, they were chosen to wait on tables. In reality, they don't wait on tables. As we read further, we find out that people such as Stephen or Philip, they are preaching the word of God. The deacons now become those who also preach God's word. So that's where our story begins. It begins with Stephen especially. The Jewish people, the ones who did not convert to Christ, they didn't like the Hellenists. 
and at the same time they accepted them because they did profess Judaism in their way of life. But they didn't like them because they mixed two cultures together. And so they weren't the favorites in a sense. And then what happened now, they begin to preach about Jesus. Those who preach this strict message, but then others like Stephen. Stephen is one who is preaching about Jesus, but he's preaching about Jesus in the sense of saying, Jesus' message overrides the law of Moses. And this is not that easily accepted, even by the Jewish converts to Christ. They hadn't thought about this yet, about well, wh where does the law of Christ fit in? So now the Hellenists are unpleasantly living among them. And the Jews, they're looking for an opportunity to go after these new Christians. And they get their opportunity with Stephen. Stephen preaches. The Jews don't like what they hear. And so they take Stephen and they're going to stone him to death. Stephen gives his last message. The Jews are stoning him to death. Not the Jewish Christians, the Jews themselves who did not convert to Christ. And so they stone Stephen to death. Incidentally, while they're stoning Stephen to death, who holds their cloaks? A young man named Saul. Saul will be a center of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. So we see it happening this way, that now they're going to stone Stephen to, Stephen to death. And when they stone Stephen to death, people are happy with this. It seems like it's something now that's really a reason for rejoicing. The Hellenists are being persecuted. Other Hellenists saw this, Hellenists living in Jerusalem. And they realized that it might not be long before they come after them. So they run away. They migrate. They go to other areas throughout Asia Minor. And where they go, they bring the message of Jesus with them with a Jewish foundation. So it's now called the way. The way really in the early church, they'd say, what about these followers of the way? The way are those who are Jews who believe in Jesus, a fulfillment of the Old Testament. So now they go out into other different countries. And in their escape, there's one person that the Acts of the Apostles speaks about, namely Philip. So Philip, he goes away and many of the people who left, who ran away, went to Samaria. Philip does the same. But then in Samaria, he comes across an Ethiopian. He's led to this Ethiopian by God. And so now he goes after the Ethiopian. He finds him reading the scripture. And he asks him, do you understand what you are reading? And the Ethiopian is saying, well, how can I? I have no one to explain it to me. So Philip now will explain it to him. And suddenly, as they're going along, Philip seems to be riding with him in the Ethiopian's carriage. As they're riding along, the Ethiopian says, well, what's to keep me from being baptized? So they're near water. They stop. And Philip takes him down into the water and baptizes him. This is a symbol of the first convert. The first convert made by the disciples of Jesus. And so we have that Ethiopian. He is now made a Christian. So then the story moves over. It moves to the one who held the cloaks, to, to Saul. Saul grows a little more. He becomes someone who now persecutes Christians. And he goes after them. He travels far and wide to go after them. And in this case, in the story of the Acts of the Apostles, he's going to Damascus to come and persecute men and women who are followers of the way. And on his way to Damascus, suddenly a bright light appears. It's God, Jesus, 
Jesus appears to him. He falls to the ground. Occasionally, we see pictures, paintings, that show uh, Saul falling from his horse. It doesn't tell us in the Acts of the Apostles that he's riding on a horse. However, he falls to the ground. And when he falls to the ground, he sees this bright light. And out of it comes the voice of Jesus. And the voice says to Saul, 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 why do you persecute me? Jesus is identifying himself with Christians. Why do you persecute me? And so it's a sign that Jesus is in Christians. Eventually, Paul would develop a theology of the body of Christ. See what happens a little later with that. But that's part of the foundation of why Paul can say, we are Christ here on earth. We are the body of Christ. So now, Saul, when the vision ends, he's blind. He cannot see. And those with him lead him on into Damascus. And in Damascus, for the next three days, he's blind. In the meanwhile, a man named Ananias, he receives a vision. And the vision tells him to go to Saul. And Ananias is saying, Lord, he's here to persecute Christians. Even though people realize the Lord was speaking to them, they still had human fear. Ananias was afraid to go to Paul. But Ananias, he then goes to Paul. And he comes to Paul and he blesses Paul. He tells Paul God has sent him. He blesses Paul and it's like scales falling from the eyes of Saul. Saul now can see. So now Ananias apparently goes on his way. And then what happens is Saul, he stays in Damascus for about three years. It's a voluntary exile in one sense. But Saul being the person he is, apparently a very intense kind of personality, someone who dedicates himself fully. And once he dedicates himself, his whole being goes into it. So Saul now begins to preach about Jesus. So for his period of time in Damascus, He's beginning to preach about Jesus. After three years, however, his people now becoming upset with Saul. They're now beginning to see that Saul is getting too many people to convert to his message. And so now there's a threat they're going to kill Saul. And they block all the gates. They're not going to let him sneak out. But some of his disciples, they lower him through a, lot, a hole in the wall. In those days, homes were built right into the wall of a town. It would save them from putting that extra wall in their homes. They would use a wall that was already there and then build their homes from there out. And so Saul was lowered to one of those openings. And Saul was able to escape. Saul went from there to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, Saul meets with James, Peter, and some of the major disciples. While he's there, he spends 15 days. Those 15 days, he learns about Jesus, about Jesus' message. But later on, he'll also claim that when he was in Damascus, he received revelations directly from God revelations that he was able to pass on through his messages. Looking back at the whole picture, in a sense, Jesus came, Jesus taught how to live, how to live as a reflection of Christ, how we, do we live individually, with some idea of living with a kind of community. But now what Saul had to do was to take all these messages of Jesus and say, let's see how we can share together as a community. Saul takes Jesus' message and makes it a community message. And so Saul really, in a sense, 
is developing the message of Jesus. Eventually, Saul's name will be changed to Paul. It's not that someone says, I'm going to change your name now, Paul. What happens? Saul, that's the Hebrew name. In Greek, his name would be Paul. So they simply started calling him by his Greek name, by Paul. So now Paul, he wants to bring together, he wants to share Christ's message. But in trying to share Christ's message, it's hard for him to get someone to join him. The reason is he was someone that was persecuting them. And whenever someone was asked, apparently, to join him, they would refuse to say, well, you know, he's the one that killed so many of us. This might be a ploy. It might be his way of capturing or finding out who among us are Christians and killing us. But there was one man who was willing to go with, with Paul, Barnabas. Barnabas, his name originally was Joseph. But they changed it from Joseph to Barnabas because of his personality, apparently. Barnabas means son of encouragement. He was a very encouraging person. He was someone who gave of himself. And now, when Paul needed a companion, the son of encouragement, Barnabas, was the one to join him. In reality, Barnabas was the head of the missionary journeys. Paul goes on a missionary journey, and we read the Acts of the Apostles. It appears that Paul is the head of those missions. In reality, Barnabas is the head, even to the point when they go into a pagan town. Barnabas is named after the mage of God. Paul is named after the God behind them, the secondary kind of God. But the idea is Barnabas is really the head of this group, but the Acts of the Apostles, it writes mainly about Paul because the writer apparently became a companion of Paul. So he knows something about Paul, or at least some of what he is gathering. He's gathered that centers on Paul. In the meanwhile, while Paul and Barnabas are continuing to share the message about Jesus, the Gentiles throughout Asia Minor are increasing and they are becoming Christian. And in becoming Christian, there's places like Antioch. Antioch becomes almost a new center of Christianity. Before this, Jerusalem was the center. Even now, Jerusalem continued to be the center. The early apostles, they go out from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the ones that sent out the apostles. It's really the center of the first church, if you want to say, the developing church. So what happens now, they're sent out from Jerusalem. And the bishop of Jerusalem, who is James, a relative of Jesus, called a brother of Jesus, but a relative in some way of Jesus. And he is the one who heads the Jerusalem church. Peter is not the one who was originally seen as the head of the church sending out apostles from uh, Jerusalem. So you see that's happening. Jerusalem is the center. It's not Rome. Rome doesn't figure into this at all for a while. Only gradually will Rome begin to see be seen as a center. Not a center such as the Jews saw Jerusalem. The Jerusalem image was very important to the Jewish people. It's where God wanted them to be. This is the land God gave them. The land was important. However, for Christianity, Jerusalem, excuse me, Rome becomes important. Not the land, but actually that's where Peter and Paul will eventually be killed. They'll be martyred there. And because of that, Rome becomes central to the meaning in the church. So many, many Gentiles come into the church. But now Paul and the others, 
they're preaching to these Gentiles and they're having a problem. The problem is these Gentiles are all adults, perhaps children, of course. And what happens among the Gentiles is that they have a culture, a way of life. Suddenly, in converting them to Christ, they not only have to impose upon them the idea of what it means to be a Christian, but also what it means to be a Jew in a sense. And then also the culture of Judaism. And circumcision, dietary laws, they become very difficult for the Gentile converts. So now Paul and Barnabas, they want to share, they want to change this if they can. The church at Antioch, they're seeing this problem and they're sending representatives. Their representatives are Paul and Barnabas. They go to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, they have what is referred to by many as the first council of the church, the Council of Jerusalem. At this council, James, the head of the church in Jerusalem, Peter, and all the leaders of early Christianity are there. If we read the Acts of the Apostles, it seems to be a simple meeting with simple exchange. But if we read some of the letters of Paul, there might have been a little bit of a heated argument debate during this period. The council, like any council, was beginning to change some of the practices, the ways of acting, some of the insights into what it means to be a Christian. And so it was happening now that James and the others, they finally said, okay, the Gentiles do not have to be circumcised. They don't have to follow all the dietary laws. They have to remain faithful to certain customs of Judaism, but not all of them. Barnabas and Paul go back to Antioch, very happy. They now have really received something that can allow them to convert the Gentiles more easily to Christ. And so this begins to spread around and we really begin to see one of the first changes in the idea of Judaism and the way, the way of them sharing Christ. Now, the Jewish customs, etc., no longer have such a strong hold on these new converts. It really affects us today because it goes down from now the Council of Jerusalem, what they allowed really affects our way of living. We're no longer under that Jewish rule. And so it had a had repercussions that come down to our present day. So now they were beginning to say, well, you don't have to follow these Jewish dietary laws. You don't have to follow these other laws. And now even Peter comes to Antioch and Peter is following the way of life of Jerusalem. The Jerusalem Council. And so he's eating with them. He's eating what would be considered unclean meat, perhaps, but certain dietary laws, they're being ignored. But then there was a very conservative group, strong, strong group that refused to give up the idea that conversion to Christ meant conversion to the Jewish customs and conversion to Jewish practice, total practice. So they came to Antioch on a visit, apparently. And it's at this time that Peter, he, he comes among them and he's worried about, I don't want to scandalize them, apparently. It doesn't say this, but it seems to be that Peter has some reason to simply ignore the practices of the Gentiles and now begins to follow the practice of those who really are more staunch Jews. Paul sees this. Paul becomes upset with Peter. And Paul says in one of in his letter to the Galatians, I stood up to Peter's face. What he really means here, he's standing up to someone who was extremely significant in the early church. One of the images there is that he stands up to Peter, but by what authority? What makes him do this? And why is it important? 
because Peter is seen to be important to the early church. So we can say that that's what he does. He confronts Peter. Paul has many laws that he brings with him. He tells the people that it's the law of Christ they should follow. They should have faith. It is faith that brings them close to Christ. We today have to say in the history of the church, history really is a way of life of many people of the world. But throughout it all, there is a certain spirit of God at work, the Holy Spirit. There's a guidance taking place. We look at the history and then we see how the church acts in history, how the Holy Spirit guides the church, how the Holy Spirit's guiding us today. There's always this onward progress taking place. And so the spirit is with us today. Paul is saying to the people, you have to have faith in Christ. It's your faith in Christ plus your works that really shows. So we have faith and we confess with our lips. We confess our faith in God, in Jesus. So Paul is saying to them, the law of Moses is no longer imposed. They don't like this. Many of the really staunch Jewish converts to Christianity don't like to hear that idea. And so now Paul begins to become someone they don't like. Paul goes into synagogues. He's thrown out of synagogues. They don't want to hear his message. Paul goes down by the seaside. He preaches to people who are gathered there. He's preaching to Gentiles. Paul becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. He's more successful when preaching to the Gentiles than he is when preaching to the Jews. Peter is more successful when he's preaching to the Jews. Peter, in a sense, is the apostle to the Jewish converts. Paul is the apostle to the Gentile converts. So that's how early history is being shaped, really. They're living in a Roman world, but at the same time, they're following the Roman. They're, they're remaining faithful to the Roman rule, but they are also growing within this Roman world. And in the Roman world, there are things happening also. In history, the Roman leadership is very easy on the Jews. They tried to force the pagan gods on the Jews, but the Jews, they couldn't make them change the idea that there was only one God. To the Romans, there were many gods. What they used to do in those days in history was they'd conquer a nation and they'd mix the nation's gods with the Roman gods. They could take upon themselves new gods, but not get rid of the old gods. So to them, there were different gods. But then when it came to Judaism, Judaism refused to budge. They believed in the one true God. So now Rome had agreed to uh, not to impose upon these Jews, the Jewish nation, these ideas of more than one God. They accepted the Jews, but only the Jews to have this one God. And as a result, also, they didn't see a distinction between those who were believing in Christ and those who were staunch Jews. Only gradually did they realize there was a distinction, that there was a growing separation between those who profess faith in Christ alone and did not accept the Mosaic law as an imposition in their life. So what happens is that gradually, Rome was beginning to realize that there's something different happening here. They're beginning to look upon Christians as a threat. They're beginning to see the Christians as separate from the Jews of Jerusalem, especially. In the meanwhile, Paul continues to speak about community. He says, Christ leaves us with the community. We are the body of Christ. That's the comparison Paul uses. If the whole body were ear, it would be useless. If the whole body were a foot, it would be useless. 
Paul says, we are the body of Christ. And just as a body has many parts, many members, so the community, the body of Christ, has many members. He does set up a small hierarchy in a sense. He talks about preachers first, prophets, certain ones who have certain gifts. But at the same time, he's saying, all of us have gifts from God for the common good. We all belong to the body of Christ. Christ is continuing to live in those who profess faith in Jesus. So Paul is saying, we're still the body of Christ. Christ is still present here on earth. What Paul is doing here in his theology, he's teaching us about the fact that we are now a large community, really pulled together, living together, expressing in the world the presence of Christ. And so Paul has introduced the idea, the body of Christ. We don't read about the body of Christ in Jesus' life. We read about it in Paul. So that's Paul's message. So Paul continues to preach his message. Peter continues to preach his message. And while they're preaching, finally, there's a group that wants to send Paul to Jerusalem. Paul will take the collection to Jerusalem. They were making a collection because Jerusalem church is becoming very, very poor. And they were in need of sustenance. They needed some kind of a collection. So those who are strict Jews and those who are followers of Jesus, the Hellenist Jews, they were all together, starving together in a sense. So Paul has gathered this collection from the many churches among the Gentiles. He brings this collection to Jerusalem. Everything is fine for a while, but then everybody gets upset. They realize what Paul is preaching. Not everybody agrees with it. A riot and so it begins. And finally, they have Paul arrested. He's arrested for the next two years. He goes from there. He's taken from there to Rome. The reason he's brought to Rome, because one day Paul says to others, do you dare to really imprison a Roman citizen like this? He frightens the leadership to imprison a, Ro a Roman citizen would be terrible without some kind of a trial. And so to get around that, the leaders there, they would send, or they sent Saul to Paul to, to Rome. On that journey, Paul would go through other difficulties, shipwreck, storms, difficulties. But Paul then reaches Rome and it continues to be in jail. People can come and visit him there. But then when Nero comes into power, Rome burns, a large part of Rome, third of Rome or more. And people are upset. They're blaming Nero. Nero needs a scapegoat. So Nero comes down now on the Christians. He's going to persecute and kill the Christians. During Nero's persecution, Peter is killed, apparently crucified. We don't know. There's no records, written records, but he's apparently crucified. Paul is beheaded because they're not allowed to crucify a Roman citizen. So Paul's beheaded. But now, as I said earlier, Rome becomes important. It's the place of the death of Peter and Paul. And for some, Peter is the first bishop of Rome, which makes him the first pope. Now we see how Christianity, how it's beginning to shape. It's beginning to get organized, but also beginning to recognize its call. So now they have a common worship. Over the years with Paul and others, they're worshiping together. They worship in the houses of the disciples. They don't really have an ordained minister each time. There's no record of Paul leading liturgy so they worship in community somehow that and this common worship is now beginning to develop they're beginning to follow certain formats that will follow with this this vision paul in his writings he talks about the eucharist 
And what he says about the Eucharist is that people sometimes came together now. This was a custom, apparently. He said, you come together, you eat and you drink, and then you share in Eucharist. But he said, there are some there who are poor, some there who don't seem to be part of what people are thinking, a little prejudice. And he's not liking what he sees. It's a Eucharistic meal. It's a community meal. It's the meal of Jesus Christ, the, the breaking of the bread. And it's not a time for sinfulness against one's neighbor. It's a time to act and love as a community, sharing as a community. So Paul says in the making a law, hereafter you shall eat and drink at home and come together for the Eucharist. And so in a sense, many feel, well, this is a sign that the church has now moved on to a way of worshiping that will develop in the first early centuries. Another symbol of the church became a symbol of service. Service became very important in the early church. They were people who had to have concern for others. The message of Jesus, one of compassion and love. The Last Supper. Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. Service is now seen as a call of Christian community. Then a very important part of Christian community is preaching. They are called to preach the word of God. And so now the word of God is being spread because preaching is part of what the early church is about. What it's showing us is that there are certain formats, certain ways of acting that are fitting into the idea of developing a church. So around the year 70, Jerusalem is destroyed. About the year 65, some of the Christians, actually Christian converts, and even those who were not, but those who were staunch Jews, they irritate the Romans. They have little guerrilla warfare. They, they fall upon Roman garrisons. Rome is becoming upset with this. Finally, by the year 70, Rome's ha had enough. So Rome sends in its armies, destroys the temple, destroys Jerusalem, kills many people. And so now what happens? The center of Judaism is falling apart. The ones who take over after the destruction of Jerusalem are not the Sadducees. They now disappear. The Sadducees, they centered their life on the temple. The temple no longer exists. So without the temple, the reason, the living of the Sadducees, that's ended. So now what happens? The Pharisees take over. And when the Pharisees take over, they begin to persecute the new converts to Christianity. They begin to say, God is punishing us. And the reason God is punishing us is because we're allowing these followers of the way to become so influential and to convert so many. God wants us to destroy them. So the Pharisees believe that. As a result of that, kind of interesting, <clears throat> is the idea that when the Gospels were written, many of the difficulties the early apostles had with the Sadducees now becomes difficulties with the Pharisees in the writing. Anybody who is an enemy of the apostles or the disciples are seen as a member of the Pharisee group. Not all the Pharisees were bad. In fact, Jesus himself might have been a Pharisee, but a different kind of Pharisee. There were Pharisees of love and there were Pharisees who were zealous, who believed in warfare. You had to reconquer the land. So what happens now is that the Pharisees, not the Pharisees of love, but those who believed that you had to control the land had taken over and they persecuted Christians. So again, Christians had to flee. Every time the Christians fled, those who stayed behind, every time they fled, they took the faith with them. And the faith now began to spread. As far as what was going on in history at the Romans, 
Rome was beginning to disintegrate very slowly. On the borders of the Romans, the Roman conquest, the Roman land, were the barbarians. The barbarians, that was a reference made in those days to those who spoke languages the people didn't understand. They were the hairy people which is what barbarian really means, the hairy people. They were people from other, other countries, but they were surrounding Rome and the Roman land, the Roman Empire. And in some cases, they'd come and they'd take over. They not only came in and robbed or stole or killed, they brought their families. They began to settle in certain places. The Roman Empire was being pushed into a smaller area. And so with all this going on, Rome wasn't having an easy time, but either. So now when they, Rome was conquered, Rome conquered Jerusalem, it was just one of the many conquests they had to make, one of the many fights they had to enter into. But now the persecution of Christians. Rome began to realize that these Christians were definitely separate from Judaism. And so now throughout the empire, they began to persecute Christians. We have a letter, seven letters actually, from Ignatius of Antioch. He was the bishop of Antioch. And on the trip from Antioch to Rome, where he was going to be put into the arena to be killed by the animals. And on that trip, some of the people were trying to say, well, let's, let's figure out ways to save him. But he would write letters and say, don't save me. This is a privilege to die for Christ. And in that letter, he also talks about church structure. By this time, he's talking about the fact that the church has bishops. The word bishop originally meant supervisor. We had supervisors. But what was happening beyond the period of the early church in places that were unseen very gradually they were called bishops. And he had kind of the idea written to what he called a monarchical bishop. A monarchical bishop, that means the bishop was like a monarch. It was one bishop. That's really what it came down to. One bishop on a large area. And he speaks about presbyters and others. But Ignatius of Antioch, it's the first time we see the idea there's one bishop being in charge of a territory. He also came up with the word Catholic. Catholic, when Ignatius used it, was simply the idea that the universal, Catholic is universal. One holy Catholic means one holy universal church throughout the world. So he applied that to believers, call them Catholic. In this period also, there were those who we would call uh, ap apologists. There are really about 16 apologists, identified apologists in the church. These were those who didn't apologize for the faith. That's not what that means. These are those who really explain the faith. They would share and be an explainer of the faith. Justin Martyr, he was a famous apologist. Justin Martyr, he was a pagan, but then he was learning about Christ. And there were people who were saying, you know, these Christians, they're all ignorant. They're willing to accept anything. We don't have to really see them as adding anything to our culture. But then Justin, he was highly educated. And one of the first educated explainers of the faith. And so he laid that foundation. He began to explain the faith and in sharing the faith with others, he was now called Justin, the apologist, the martyr, Justin the martyr, because eventually he was martyred. In those days, there was a governor who wrote to Emperor Trajan and he asked him, he said, are we supposed to persecute or kill these Christians? Trajan sent back and said, no, no, you don't have to search them out. But if someone accuses them, then, yes, we'll persecute them. Apparently, someone accused Ignatius 
of Antioch. Someone accused Justin Martyr. They were accused and they were persecuted and they were killed. So really what was happening in history, the emperors are trying to hold together a slowly disintegrating Roman Empire. And at the same time, they'll try many different means of doing it. Persecution was the first one. Nero began the persecutions. Nero didn't just kill Peter and Paul. He killed many Christians. But that went on periodically in different places throughout the empire, down to the time of many of the emperors. And so we see what's happening is that the empire now is trying to protect itself. The strongest form of protection was unity. What brought unity to that particular land, to the empire, was a singleness of purpose, a singleness of faith. If they were all pagan, they were united. Even more, if they honored the emperor, worshiped the emperor, that was even better. So it was happening, they wanted to hold together the empire by protecting the religion of paganism. And so we see what's happening, how history is playing its part in the early growth and the continued growth of the church throughout the world. May the light of Christ lead me, the power of Christ be with me, the wisdom of Christ inspire me, the word of Christ instruct me, the shelter of Christ protect me, the hand of Christ hold me, and the love of Christ be in me. May the grieving find support in me, the sad find joy in me, the depressed find hope in me, the weak find strength in me, the doubters find faith in me, the rejected find love in me, and the world find Christ in me. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.